flash down. Yeah, okay. Well, this is impressive. I've never seen one of these. Oh. I think it's probably quite out of, you know, we've, the university's had these for a few years, so mm. it's probably old technology now. It certainly can be slow, as you can see. It's a big campus, yeah. for sure. Yeah. We used to have a golf run go there. Oh, okay. <laughs> they chew them up. Yeah. yeah, just a golf run. That's still a golf run. Desktop is giving me trouble. Oh, yeah. oh no, here we go. It's okay. 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 No problem. <laughs> now, uh, I usually move around a little bit. Yeah, we've got a cord mic. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I'll try not to. <laughs> So, uh, Sydney, no, no, actually, please go back. Versus Blue, that one. And that's the, uh, yeah. Just click OK. Where should I get this? Okay, so that's just the cord mic, so you can also hold it, put it round your neck as you like. Okay. It's got a fairly long, let's move that chair out of the way. We might start in order to have extra time. Uh, I introduce Professor Adolfo Garcia. He's adjunct, adjunct professor of neurolinguistics at uh, the National University of Cuyo in Mendoza in Argentina. He's a 
postdoctorate fellow at the National Science and Technology Research Council of Argentina. We know those kinds of uh, competitive uh, awards, so it's very good that he uh, has achieved this. His uh, original supervisor was Augustin Ibanez, and uh, his uh, supervisor was head of experimental psychology and neuroscience lab at the Institute of Cognitive Neurology in Buenos Aires, where Professor Garcia completed his PhD. He has a very broad range of topics within his publications. They include just about every section of our very diverse department, maybe not Trevor's section, uh, but uh, certainly the today's topic on the embodied nature of material processes uh, ties in very uh, distinctly with interests our whole department has. As I said, uh, Professor Garcia has been particularly uh, active also in translation and I found looking through the publications in greater detail also in the area of uh, medical interpretation. The translation work has included his wonderful uh, bringing together of his interests in what was once or originally called uh, stratificational grammar or stratificational linguistics more properly, uh, the developments of Professor Sidney Lamb, who may have been the first to coin the word cognitive linguistics, or the terms, and uh, his understanding Professor Garcia's understanding of systemic functional theory and you'll see that if you uh, write to me or to Professor Garcia you'll be able to follow up with numerous uh, beautifully presented papers including a, uh, an interview with Sid Lamb over these convergences between different approaches to uh, linguistic problems. Well, what linguistic problems? It's often uh, vexed me that uh, people seem to assume if you're interested in the interactive and social side of linguistics, somehow or other you're not interested so much in the neural implications of the language. And I even see this uh, repeated on, on lists, um, websites, etc. Somehow or other uh, SFL hasn't had a, a particular interest in what people refer to as cognitive or should perhaps call a neuro-linguistic. And it was a wonderful opportunity I had to meet Professor Garcia at the foundation of the World Languages Journal and to see how readily he brought these issues together with the fact, which I was reminded of, that in fact systemic fun functional linguistics has always concerned itself with the evolutionary framework and I think as linguists we all have to understand what we're doing in terms of a broader uh, not necessarily philosophical, but a broader scientific framework. And this is one of the wonderful contributions I think that Professor Garcia's work has made. And uh, I give you over to him now so that he can introduce you to his work. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. <coughs> Let me just see if I can get this around my neck here. <coughs> can you hear me okay there? Is that okay? Okay, well, thanks for being here. <coughs> Uh, I'll try to make this, uh, uh, these uh, 50 minutes that we have ahead of us rather enjoyable. Um, so, yeah, the idea uh, of uh, today's presentation is to bring together some notions within systemic functional linguistics and some recent uh, findings from neuroscience, neurolinguistics in particular, and I'll be uh, emphasizing some recent research that we've conducted in our lab in Buenos Aires. So. Uh, we'll be talking about the, the embodied nature of material processes uh, and uh, to put it in more neuro-linguistic uh, uh, terms, that we'll be looking at the neural correlates of action language. Now, just to know um, where everyone here stands, uh, is everyone familiar with systemic functional linguistics here or is there anybody in the audience who has not had any previous experience with that framework? We're on the same boat, right? Uh, all right, great. Um, <coughs> well, because of that then, you might know by now that uh, systemic functional linguistics has evolved throughout the years, uh, going back to the 60s, 
uh, through contributions made from several different angles, ranging from the descriptive and the applied to the clinical, computational, and cognitive, to say the least. Now, what I've noticed in my own appraisal of the, uh, of the uh, SFL literature is that there is virtually no research conducted on the neurological plausibility of SFL constructs. This is what I refer to as a neurocognitive gap in the field. So uh, basically, you could say that this presentation today will try to bridge this gap uh, to whatever extent is possible. Now, <clears throat> the only exception to this, uh, in my understanding, is the work of Robin Marrows. Uh, but saying the work of Robin Marrows is actually quite of an exaggeration because he's only written two papers uh, on the possible uh, pathways of connection between SFL and neurolinguistics. Uh, and in those two papers, what he does basically is to provide a, a survey of different neuroscientific studies on the processing of attitude, evaluation, and theory of mind. Uh, and interpret, and he's, he interprets those findings in terms of interpersonal semantics. Yeah? And uh, he also proposes some, in my opinion, rather loose associations between the mirror neuron system and ideational semantics. Uh, very succinctly, he highlights the contribution of prefrontal brain areas to both metafunctions. But if you ask me, this is uh, pretty much everything that has been done in terms of the neurocognitive basis of systemic functional linguistics. <clears throat> okay, so I will try to contribute to this uh, avenue of interaction somehow, but maybe you might be asking yourselves here, well, but why should a linguistic theory be concerned with neurocognitive evidence in the first place? Well, there's no reason why you should you know, actually pay attention to the brain, but uh, you can perfectly do very solid scientific linguistics without considering neurological evidence, but I believe that there are many things to be gained uh, by considering uh, you know, neurobiological data. And let me just uh, quote a couple of eminent neurolinguists here. This is Professor Friedman Pulvermuller, who conducts his own neurolinguistics lab uh, in Cambridge University. And he's, in his 2002 book titled The Neuroscience of Language, he stated, and I quote, the brain machinery is not just one arbitrary way of implementing the processes it realizes, as for example, any hardware computer configuration can realize almost any computer program or piece of software. The claim is that instead, the hardware reveals aspects of the program. It may be that the neuronal structures themselves teach us about aspects of the computational processes that are laid down in these structures. A realistic model of language, therefore, must specify the putative organic basis of language use and language comprehension in terms of neurons, neuronal connections, and neuron circuits. So this is a position that I totally align with. Uh, <clears throat> and then perhaps, uh, well, David was mentioning today, Sid Lamb, Perhaps some of you might be familiar with, with his work, which is pretty much compatible with most of the tenets of uh, SFL. In fact, Michael Halliday and, uh, and uh, Professor Lamb um, collaborated quite a bit, uh, going back to the 70s and extending to the 60s even. Yeah, definitely. And all the way back to well, well, very recent years, right? And um, I am quoting Professor Lamb here, who stated that a successful theory has to be compatible with what is known about the brain from neurology and from cognitive neuroscience. A worthy goal is to provide a plausible account of linguistic operations, and let me just skip here a little bit. At the systems level, the localization of elementary functions in particular parts of the cortex and the connections among the different subsystems which support their complex interactions in performing higher level functions like those involved in language processing. So my goal today, given these, uh, these uh, prolegomena, if you will, is to interpret neurolinguistic evidence, in particular data from our own lab in Buenos Aires, in the light of SFL constructs, and to elaborate on the notions of stratification and naturalness. In doing so, I'll be trying to address two main questions, namely, what are the neurological correlates of the distinction between processes and participants, and two, how and where are material 
processes and verbs on the one hand, uh, actually processes and verbs, let me uh, rephrase that, represent them in the brain. And I will focus on processes and verbs of doing. So I think I may be preaching to the choir here by going over some of the very basic SFL notions, but you know, let's do this very quickly. Uh, the theory proposes that language is a, is a system that is actually organized in terms of uh, strata. Yeah, and um, basically options that are made available uh, in, the, in the stratum of context or constellations of options become realized by options or constellations of options within the semantic system, if you will. And those options in turn become realized by lexicogrammatical options and then the phonology and then the phonetics and so on. You know this better than I do. Now, uh, an interesting claim of the theory is that the, here, the interface, uh, the connection, if you will, between the semantic stratum and the lexicogrammatical stratum is natural uh, in nature. I mean, uh, in this sense, this is different from what happens uh, between the lexicogrammar and the phonological stratum, which in Zasurian terms, you know, represents the sort of arbitrary relationship. But here the claim instead is that options within the lexical grammar are semantically motivated. Yeah? All right. <coughs> now, this notion of naturalness, I will try to expand on it somehow. And in particular, and I am I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of spoiling or anticipating the punchline here, but uh, I will argue that some of the realizational distinctions within semantics and then the lexical end of the lexical grammatical continuum are grounded in more basic non-linguistic neurocognitive distinctions. If by the end of this talk we can come back to this sentence and make sense of it, well, my task will have been accomplished, I think. Now, <coughs> you know, the, the theory proposes that we use language mainly for two main purposes. We rely on language to construe a model of experience through the ideational metafunction. And we also rely on language to establish and maintain social relations. That's the concern of the interpersonal metafunction. And of course, we need to organize this course somehow. And that's uh, where the textual metafunction uh, kicks in. Now, all throughout this talk, I will be uh, focusing only on the ideational metafunction. And in cognitive terms, the ideational metafunction has been claimed to manifest itself as the ideation base. I'm relying here on Professors Halliday and Matheson's 1999 book, which you might be familiar with. And uh, this ideation base uh, was therein defined as a multidimensional meaning potential with an extensive system of semantic alternatives organized as clients. Now, within that ideation base, uh, we have a whole range of systems and, and, and options that enable us to represent or construe situations around processes. Of course, you know this, right? And uh, these processes involve participants, uh, which may or may not be overtly manifested uh, at the lexicogrammatical level. And optionally, we can have circumstances, but it, that is beyond the point in this talk. So we can have a clause like the boy pressed the button, and here we have a material process or a process of doing, we should say in more recent terms, which implies two uh, participants, namely an actor and a goal here. <coughs> now, notice that although processes are inextricably bound to the participants they implicate, both constructs are ontologically different. First, semantically, in semantic terms, Processes and participants represent different type of phenomena. Prototypically, events are manifested by processes, but participants uh, realize or allow us to construe entities. And at the lexical level, processes and participants are prototypically realized by different word classes, typically verbs for processes and nouns and or adjectives for participants. Now, <coughs> So we can have something like this and elaborate in this analysis. And in terms of these ontological differences that I just mentioned, notice that entities are individuated, relatively atemporal regions in conceptual semantic space 
that are more likely to be identified by the set of their sensory properties. I am quoting Black and Shia. I think that's how you would pronounce the last name. On the other hand, events are temporal relations with less of a tight fit between sense-based properties and linguistic semantic properties. Uh, <clears throat> and if we focus on processes in particular, well, you know, we can classify them in different ways, and they have been classified in different ways and grouped in, in different ways, and uh, we have good grounds to say that we have a whole constellation or a set of processes which we can label processes of doing, and then we have processes of sensing, saying, and being, and we can further subclassify them. But the point here that I, that I would like to make is that there are very good linguistic um, reasons to establish first the distinction between processes and participants, and then the distinction between different process types. So uh, just by way of example, these are Halliday's criteria distinct, uh, for distinguishing material and mental processes. The material processes you can pretty much take as the same as processes of doing in more contemporary jargon. So uh, basically, uh, there are linguistic reasons to discriminate between them. Uh, for, for instance, material processes or processes of doing, they lend themselves much better to metaphenomenological uses. Uh, actually, uh, l let me correct myself there. They rarely allow themselves to uh, participate in meta metaphenomenological uses. He ate it, but you, can, you couldn't say he ate that. I have a, uh, an embedded clause there, right? However, mental processes, well, you know, you can perfectly, he thinks that, he'll do something, he believes that, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so we, we have a whole set of reasons here to say, you know, there are good uh, linguistic reasons. We mentioned the semantic uh, contrast, the lexical contrast. You have even distributional um, uh, differences among different process types. And you have these, uh, I don't know if you still use this term, but the reactancies, right? The fact that different types of verbs react different to dif uh, differently to different types of probes that you can apply on them. Okay, <coughs> now let me recap my objectives here because my main question is, okay, in addition to, to these linguistic distinctions that have been very eloquently been posed throughout the development of the theory, do we have uh, neurological evidence to support the view that these distinctions may have some cognitive or neurocognitive plausibility? And with that in mind, what I will try to do now is to explore what are the neurological correlates of the distinction between processes and verbs on the one hand, participants and nouns on the other, and then how and where are material processes and verbs represented in the brain with an emphasis on processes of doing. Okay, so <coughs> this is quite interesting, but how do you do it? Well, let me just go very, very quickly here over some of the methods that uh, we use in our lab and that are more generally speaking used in uh, neurolinguistics to explore the neurobiological underpinnings of language. Basically, we can rely on brain recordings of different types. And with both neurotypical, this is the fancier term for you know, people with a healthy brain, basically, both with neurotypical and with brain lesioned subjects, we can measure brain activity patterns as they perform relevant linguistic tasks. Now, we can use techniques such as um, electroencephalography and the associated technique of um, event-related potentials to measure electrical patterns of activity uh, during neurological processes. Uh, maybe you've seen this. Basically, what you do is you apply a whole set of electrodes. Uh, nowadays, the standard number is 128, and you can measure activity, uh, changes in the voltage yeah, of uh, electrical signals going inside the axons of neurons. And this technique gives you very good temporal resolution. We can detect changes in the pattern of activity within the order of milliseconds, but this is a technique with very poor spatial resolution. What this technique does not allow you to do is to say where in the brain those significant changes in activity patterns occurred. However, there are many other techniques, such as magnetoencephalography and functional magnetic resonance imaging and uh, positron emission tomography right here, 
And all of these techniques, they do have very, very uh, high spatial resolution. So we can rely on these techniques to measure significant uh, uh, changes in the activation patterns in the brain and locate them in specific areas of the cortex and even in subcortical structures sometimes. <coughs> so that's one thing that we can do. And then with, uh, we can also rely on what are known as dissociations and also double dissociations with uh, patients, with brain lesion patients. We can examine whether damage to a specific area of the brain selectively impairs a given function. And to be more precise here, whether uh, that damaged brain area leads to compromise or deficits in processing certain options within the ideation base and the lexical grammar. So the rationale here is that if you have a patient whose lesion or main uh, area of brain atrophy, depending on what the, the etiology is, uh, let's say that you have damage here in the, uh, in the temporal parietal uh, region with complete sparing of the frontal lobes, for instance, maybe you can see that this patient will feature marked deficits in processing certain types of linguistic units, semantic or lexical grammatical units, if you will, with no uh, deficits in processing other types of linguistic units. So this is very, very, in a very sketchy manner, I know, this is what we understand by a dissociation, all right? Now, of course, regardless of whether you are measuring brain activity patterns or just looking for uh, behavioral patterns of dissociation, you need to have your subjects do something. Now, what is it that we, ha we might have them do that is of linguistic relevance? Well, we can use certain um, standardized uh, tests that enable us to tap semantic processing. So one that we've, we've been using lately is the so-called kissing and dancing test. KDT for short. This was actually developed um, by uh, neuroscientists who are now based here in uh, Australia, Thomas Pack and uh, Professor John Hodges. Um, and uh, this is a task that uh, allows you to examine uh, processing of material motor processes, processes of doing, we might say. So this is, uh, are, are you familiar with this task? Let me just you know, tell you how it works. This is, uh, this would be a typical trial in this, uh, in this task. So what you have is a triad of, of uh, images, yeah? Uh, this is the base image at the top and you have two options at the bottom and the patient is instructed to choose which of the two options from the bottom uh, is most closely related in meaning to the one on the top. Now there is no language involved here. All they have to do is say, is point, okay? So that's, uh, so, you know, you need to have some semantic processing to say, okay, you know, this image corresponds uh, somehow to this one, but there is no lexicogrammatical activity during this task. And uh, notice that in this case, the kissing and dancing test, all the images, they denote actions, motor actions, yeah? Such as writing, typing, staring here. Now, there is a counterpart to that, which is this very same layout and this very same rationale this is the pyramids and palm trees test, PPT for short, and it's, it's exactly the same thing, but instead of having images of actions, what you have is images of objects. So here, you can use this test to tap processing of participant entities, yeah, at the semantic level. And uh, there are also so many tasks that we can use to measure strictly um, lexical grammatical processing. In particular here, all these tasks can be used to measure lexical processing. So you can have the, your patients, or not just your patients, I mean even your neurotypical subjects, engage in word production tasks, perhaps just reading words out loud or even silently. Picture naming, you show them a picture and you have them na uh, name that picture. Associated word production, you show them a word and you ask them to uh, produce a synonym or an antonym or a word that, that's uh, phonologically related to the first one and so on. You can give them verbal fluency tests. Basically, this is, it goes as follows. You, you tell the, the participant, you have one minute to uh, name as many words as you can that comply with the following constraint. They must begin with this phoneme, for instance. So that is a phonological fluency test. Or that constraint may be semantic in nature. 
and you can tell okay, you can tell them okay so you have one minute to give me as many words as you can that pertain to the category animals or vegetables okay and then we can also use lexical decision tasks you know basically you show the participants sequences of letters some of which constitute real words in their language and some of which are non words or pseudo words and the participants must decide whether each sequence of letters constitutes a word or not and what's interesting here is that any of these paradigms we can use them with specific lexical contrasts so we can see for example what the performance is in any of these tasks uh, when processing verbs versus processing nouns or when processing verbs of doing versus processing verbs of sensing and so on okay <coughs> So let's start taking a look at some results, some, some of the evidence available. First, let's take a look at the neural correlates of the distinction between processes and verbs on the one hand and participants and nouns on the other. Perhaps the foundational study in this line of research is the one conducted by Martin and colleagues in 1995. What they did was they used achromatic line drawings of common objects, an unnecessarily fancy way of saying black and white pictures, if you ask me, and uh, the participants, th these were neurotypical participants, they were given three tasks. First, they had to name those pictures. Then, they had to generate an associated color word. And then they had to generate an associated action word, a verb of doing. Notice that by generating associated color words, they were forced to, pro to engage in participant and noun or adjective processing, whereby here, they were forced to engage in process and verb processing. Does this make sense? Okay, and then the same tasks were used with verbal stimuli as opposed to the pictures, yeah? And brain recordings were obtained during the tasks through the uh, PET technique. Basically, what was found in this study for both the picture-based and the word-based uh, tasks was that generation of color words uh, Implica implicating participant processing, selectively activated a region in the ventral temporal lobe just anterior to the area responsible for the perception of color. <coughs> Instead, the generation of action words implicating processing of processes of doing activated the middle temporal gyrus just anterior to the area involved in the perception of motion and Broca's area and the cerebellum, two of the crucial hubs for motor execution. So this first study already incarnates the spirit of today's presentation. My claim is that with evidence like this, you can see that these distinctions that have been theoretically posited within the ideation base and then within the lexical end of the lexical grammatical continuum are actually rooted based on, grounded in, if you will, more basic uh, neurocognitive distinctions that the brain cares for. <coughs> Another study worth mentioning here is the one conducted by Perani and colleagues in 1999. Here they used two types of stimuli, nouns on the one hand, verbs on the other. Uh, they administered a lexical decision task. The subjects were shown sequences of letters, as I told you today, and they had to decide, okay, this is a word, this is a non-word, etc. And once again, uh, brain recordings were, were obtained through the PET technique. And uh, what was found here was the following. The left dorsolateral frontal and lateral temporal cortices were activated only by verbs. They were not engaged by noun processing. And that is very significant because the left dorsolateral frontal um, area is pretty much engaged by motor execution. It's a crucial hub for moving your body. And the uh, lateral temporal cortices are activated by the perception of motion. So once again, what I'm trying to highlight here is that the linguistic processes you engage in seem to be grounded in more basic uh, neurocognitive systems, which are extra-linguistic, if you will. Now, a more recent study by Shapiro and colleagues, uh, they used nouns, verbs, and pseudo-nouns and pseudo-verbs, 
uh, this, just for you to have an idea, these are not words which, which still comply with some of the morphological aspects that it enable you to say, okay, this is a noun or nounish. So a pseudo noun could be, I don't know, pa palation. You know, it doesn't mean anything, but you can, un you can spot by its morphology that it's bound to be a noun somehow. All right, and what the subjects had to do was to, they were given these stimuli and they had to use them to produce short phrases, including those words. And brain recordings were obtained through uh, magne uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging in this case. Now, the, the, the findings here were quite eloquent. There were selective verb activations uh, recorded on the left prefrontal cortex and the left superior parietal lobule. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, roughly the same area we've been highlighting in the previous studies, which is responsible for motor execution. And this left superior parietal lobule is an area engaged by the somato somatosensory feedback you receive when you are engaging in motor action. You know, when you move your body, you have the feedback. Your, feedba your body has the feedback that it has just moved, okay? So these are the crucial hubs uh, involved in those processes. However, the nouns yielded distinctive patterns of activation in the inferior, in the left inferior temporal lobule. And this is an, this is an area, again, that we've mentioned before, where you have integration of perceptual attributes. This is the conceptual hub of the brain, if you will. You know, if you take a look, if you, you're walking in the park and you see a dog, and the dog barks, and then you, you know, you, you pat it. Well, you have on the one hand visual information coming in because you see it. You have somatosensory information because you touch it. And you have auditory information because you hear its barks. Okay, at some point, all those, th th those signals become integrated. The hub where that integration takes place, and if you will, this is the hub for conceptual processing in the brain, is the, infi the, the inferior temporal uh, lobe, the anterior inferior temporal lobe. <coughs> and again, the point here is that this was engaged by nouns selectively. All this evidence that I just commented on was obtained uh, with uh, neurotypical samples. But this is a very interesting study conducted with two patient groups. On the one hand, we had um, a semantic dementia group, and then we had a, fronto, a frontal variant frontotemporal dementia group. Now, we don't really need to go into details regarding these two neurodegenerative disorders, but let me just say the following. In semantic dementia, what you have is progressive but selective atrophy of the temporal lobes with complete sparing, at least in the early stages, of the frontal lobes. However, in FTD, you have the exact opposite pattern. The atrophy compromises the frontal lobes with complete sparing of the temporal lobes. So remember that we were just highlighting the crucial contribution of the frontal lobes to processes of verbs and the crucial contribution of the temporal lobe to participants and nouns. So in this study by Back and Hodges, they administered the kissing and dancing test that we saw, tapping processing of processes, <laughs> and uh, the PPT, tapping processing of participant options at the semantic level. And what was observed was that in the frontal group, in the frontal temporal dementia group, uh, th these patients were more significantly impaired on the kissing and dancing test. And instead, the semantic dementia group with atrophy focused on the temporal lobes was more significantly impaired on the PPT, tapping processing of participant entities. So this aligns quite well with the previous findings I mentioned, and they could go on with evidence like this. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence here coming from Parkinson's disease patients. So I don't know if you are familiar with Parkinson's disease, but this is um, a highly prevalent uh, neurodegenerative motor disorder, which results from an alteration of the dopaminergic neurons in the basal ganglia, a complex set of subcortical structures. And this is characterized mainly by motor symptoms, uh, resting tremors and, uh, you know, slow movement and things like that. Now, what you see all across the board using different paradigms in Parkinson's disease patients is that they feature selective deficits 
of processes and verbs of doing with a partial to complete sparing of participant and noun processing. And this has been separately observed in many studies using different tasks such as picture naming, related word production, lexical decision, and verbal fluency. So a preliminary conclusion here is that <coughs> processes and verbs seem to be critically dependent on frontal basal brain areas, whereas participants and nouns seem to, seem to differentially rely on temporal hubs within the brain. So the ontological distinction between both categories, which has been before, as we mentioned, uh, supported by strictly linguistic, distributional, lexical, semantic evidence, seems to be consistent with neurocognitive distinctions. And more precisely, notice that processes and verbs seem to be grounded in regions supporting motor action and perception, whereas participants and nouns seem to be grounded in areas supporting perception of attributes and integration of perceptual information. <clears throat> now moving on to the second part of the presentation today, le let's take a closer look at processes and verbs of doing. So, you know, I mentioned Parkinson's disease, yeah, this uh, motor disorder, yeah. Parkinson's disease patients in the early stages, um, you know, they may have some compromise of higher order cognitive functions, but, you know, their main symptomatology is motor in nature. And uh, so this is a very good model of the crucial role of the basal ganglia in processing motor action. <coughs> Remember that these patients feature selective deficits in processes and verbs of doing. Now, this supports the view that has come to be known in the literature uh, as embodied cognition. The claim basically is that the neural representation of abstract categories is grounded in the regions supporting relevant basic level information. My contention today, building on this line of thought, is that processes and verbs of doing are naturally grounded in the neural regions supporting motor, non-linguistic motor information. So <clears throat> let me quote this recent study, which is really, really uh, phenomenal by Ferdinandino and colleagues. They uh, tested non-demented Parkinson's disease patients and a control group. And uh, they used verbs of doing, which they called action verbs, and verbs of sensing, which they called abstract verbs. And basically, the uh, participants had to engage in two different tasks, a lexical decision task and a semantic similarity judgment task. Notice that this, is, uh, this task taps processing at the lexical level, and this one does so at the semantic level. Now, <coughs> what was observed here was that the, Parkin the Parkinsonian patients were more impaired at processing the verbs of doing, the action verbs, than they were at processing the abstract verbs, the verbs of sentencing. Remember, the, 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 the point here is that you have a, a population or a sample of motor patients, and they exhibit more significant deficits in processing motor processes, if you will, processes of doing, than more abstract processes, such as processes of, of sensing. And this was observed separately, both in the response, uh, response time during the tasks and in the percentage of correct responses. So this warrants the conclusion, and I'll be quoting off the, the authors right here, the design of the study rules out the possibility that the deficit observed in the Parkinson's group reflects a general impairment of verb processing, rather indicating that the differential effect of motor system impairment on the two conditions was a function of the core meanings associated with the words. Uh, and there is abundant evidence consistent with this idea that when you have damage to the neural regions controlling your motor action, you will have selective, more marked selective deficits in, uh, in processing the linguistic units which manifest linguistically those motor actions. So processes and verbs of doing have been shown to be differentially impaired in other neurodegenerative motor disorders compromising the basal ganglia motor neuron disease, amyotrophical lateral sclerosis, progressive super, supranuclear palsy, 
frontotemporal dementia, corticobasal degeneration, and Huntington's disease. <coughs> so we have all this evidence, and uh, there seems to be, mm, you know, a lot of evidence that supports this idea that processes and verbs of doing are grounded in the regions of the brain that support motor action in particular. But in our lab, we asked ourselves, okay, uh, we started asking ourselves more specific questions about this. The first one we tackled was, which neural network supports this seemingly natural ability to integrate information from motor routines and processes and verbs of doing? So what we used here was what we call the ACE task. This is uh, an acronym for Action Sentence Compatibility Effect. Let me tell you how this works. We show the, uh, the participants, the subjects in our studies, sentences presented word by word. And all of the sentences, they end with a verb. But those verbs, all of them denote manual actions, actions that you perform with the hand. Now, crucially, we have a set of sentences whose final verbs denote open hand actions, such as waving, caressing, clapping, applauding, if you will. But then we have other sentences whose final uh, verb of doing manifests an action that you would perform with a closed hand, such as knocking, punching, hammering. And uh, what we do here is we show the subjects the, those sentences and we ask them to press a button as soon as they have understood the full meaning of the sentence. Now, here's the crucial manipulation. In some blocks, we will have the subjects press that button with their open hand. And in some other blocks, we will have the subjects press the button with their closed hand. And this yields both compatible and incompatible conditions. I don't know if you're following the idea here. So, you know, a compatible condition would be an open hand verb to which you respond with your open hand and vice versa. A very robust finding using this paradigm is that in uh, neurotypicals, you observe faster, significantly faster reaction times in the compatible than in the incompatible condition, which suggests that there is a sort of priming effect yeah, in linguistic processing when you are engaged in a congruent motor process. Does this make sense? Are you following this, this idea? <clears throat> okay, so we have this and uh, you know, we have quite a number of papers where we've, we've, we've found this, but then our question was, okay, what happens if you administer this task to a sample with impairment in those crucial hubs that integrate motor and linguistic information. So we applied this task to a group of Parkinson's disease patients and their respective controls, and we also administered the kissing and dancing test. What we observed was that this action sentence compatibility effect was significantly reduced in the Parkinsonian group, and that that deficit was independent of their general cognitive state. And we also observed that they were impaired on the uh, KDT, as has been shown before uh, elsewhere in the literature. And uh, so, you know, this warrants the conclusion that um, if, you, if you are impaired in the motor systems that regulate motor ex execution, you also have impairments in your ability to integrate yeah, motor and linguistic information. That will be the key uh, interpretation of our results here. Um, <coughs> In that same study, we conducted another experiment. This one was led by uh, my advisor, Dr. Ibanez, whom David mentioned today. And this is very interesting because what we did here was to administer this ACE task to epileptic patients, and uh, we obtained intracranial recordings. Basically, we inserted very long electrodes directly into their brains, and this is as direct neurological evidence as you can obtain. Uh, and there were electrodes inserted in their primary motor and premotor cortices, the crucial hubs for initiating motor action in the brain, and also in left cortical regions involved in semantic processing, namely the inferior frontal gyrus, as well as the middle and superior temporal gyri. So, you know, with the electrodes in their brains, we had the subjects play our little game here. And what we observed was we found simultaneous bidirectional effects. What do we mean by this? Brain signals, signaling, motor preparation, affected language processing. And at the same time, 
processes initiated in language relevant areas modulated activity patterns in motor areas. So what this shows is that the connection that we have been spotting between the motor system and the semantic and lexical system is not just in one way. It's not unidirectional. Actually, what you have is a synergy, and both systems influence one another during uh, these uh, motor verbal integration tasks. <coughs> but then we ask ourselves, OK, so, so there, we, we seem to have very solid evidence that processes and verbs of doing are grounded in the motor system. But are they grounded in the neural motor system, that is to say, in the brain circuits that regulate and coordinate motor action? Or might they be, might they be grounded in the peripheral musculo, musculoskeletal system? So how do you explore this question? Well, here's what we did. This is a paper that uh, we published earlier this year. Uh, we administered the ACE task to three patient groups, but the crucial manipulation was this one. One of the groups was a Parkinson's disease patient group. And as we've seen, this is a model of motor impairment resulting from brain damage. Yeah? A Parkinsonian patient does not have a problem with their muscles or, or the, their tendons. Yeah? Their motor symptoms reflect a neurological disorder. However, we also had two other groups, a neuromyelitis optica group and, a, and an acute traverse myelitis group. These are two models of injury to non-brain motor areas, yeah? the peripheral motor system. So these are motor disorders, but they result from peripheral affectation, not from neurological damage. And uh, what we observed, we also administered the kissing and dancing test. Yeah? And uh, we observed that the Parkinson's disease patients showed impaired performance on both the action sentence compatibility effect task and the kissing and dancing test. And you can see here, for example, but no such deficits were observed in the other two groups. So for example, here you have the comparison of accuracy in the kissing and dancing test between the neuromyelitis optica group and their controls. You can see roughly the same thing. The acute traverse myelitis group versus their controls, exactly the same level of performance. But here's the Parkinsonian group and their controls. And then here we have the results for the ACE task as well, which goes exactly in the same line. So this suggests that, um, in fact, the grounding of motor relevant linguistic information in uh, motor, in the motor domain, occurs at brain level, not at a peripheral musculoskeletal level. And uh, the final question we asked ourselves, I don't know how much time I have left. Um, About five minutes? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna really rush through this one. Uh, let me just say, we asked ourselves another question and we came to an answer, but I, I'd rather jump to the conclusions, yeah? Uh, if you're interested, I can then tell you a little bit more about this third study. Okay, but it goes in the, in, in the same line. Now, this is the model we've constructed with our own evidence and previous evidence in the literature. And uh, basically the grounding of motor relevant linguistic information in motor systems seems to engage these brain areas, namely the basal ganglia, as we've seen in, 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 in the Parkinsonian patients, and also the inferior frontal gyrus, the temporal cortex, and the motor cortex. And our interpretation, to put it in very simple terms, would be that the activation of action and motor routines through the basal ganglia primes representations of processes and verbs of doing in frontal areas, leading to further processing of more abstract conceptual relations in temporal brain regions. <clears throat> so with all this evidence that I uh, threw, just threw out at you, let me see what we can conclude. Um, the first conclusion, and I'm just recapping what I stated, what I stated earlier, is that processes of verbs on the one hand and participants and nouns on the other seem to rely on different brain areas, most likely due to the differential role of such brain areas in basic non-linguistic functions, such as motor execution and motor perception on the one hand and perceptual integration on the other. And processes and verbs of doing in particular 
seem to rely critically on a distributed network, the one that I just showed you on that model, involving the basal ganglia as crucial circuits or crucial hubs. So processes and verbs of doing seem to be naturally grounded in motor networks, or at least they seem to rely on networks which largely overlap with motor uh, circuits, if you will. <coughs> now, notice that there is a high level of congruency between the participant, the, the, the subject's performance on semantic and lexical tasks. What do I mean by this? If a patient group is impaired in processing processes, it will they will also be impaired in processing verbs. And if they are impaired at processing participant information through the PPT, uh, for example, they will also be impaired in noun processing. To my view, such intracategorical consistency supports the view that the relationship between the semantic and the lexical grammatical stratum is natural. It is not just arbitrary. If it were arbitrary, it wouldn't have this such a high level of congruency in the performance patterns that you observe in these patient groups. <clears throat> and more generally, lexical options are rooted in semantic options within the ideation base, even neurally, I would say. So we had this model, and you know, we said that uh, in SSL terms, the relationship between the semantics and the lexical grammar is natural. Well, neurolinguistics seems to be confirming this from an entirely different perspective. So we could add that lexical options are rooted in semantic options within the ideation base, even neurobiologically speaking. But let me go a little bit further here, and I believe that the data suggest the possibility of a supra-semantic stratum, which is naturally related to the ideation base, and which we might call embodied cognition. What do I mean by this? We have this, right? So we just said that the options within the lexical end of the lexical grammatical continuum are naturally based on semantic distinctions. But let me add this. I will say that options within the semantics, within the ideation base, are actually grounded and naturally related to options within this embodied cognition level, which is pre-verbal, which is extra-linguistic. So my contention is that well-established distinctions in the ideation base follow naturally from more basic, non-linguistic, neurocognitive distinctions. So just like options within grammar are semantically motivated, so are options within semantics somatotopically motivated and neurocognitively grounded. So looking forward, <coughs> might it be too uh, extreme to postulate the possibility of a neuro SSL? I believe that neurolinguistics might be a fruitful avenue to further progress within uh, the community. And uh, something that we could do, and we, we've published a paper with my advisor earlier this year, is maybe we can rely on this theoretical distinction that SFL advocates uh, of processes and verbs of doing as a diagnostic tool. And I, maybe I can tell you a little bit more about that uh, once we are done here with the talk. Uh, and I, I could give you this paper if you want to read some of the clinical implications we've outlined. And uh, there are so many questions that we could explore in the future. For example, where are the neural bases of other process types? We've focused on processes of doing. What about processes of sensing? What about processes of saying? Are they grounded in distinct uh, identifiable neural regions? And if so, which ones? Which paradigms would offer useful data? Which tasks would you have your subjects engage in? And more generally, are all of the theoretical distinctions within SFL reflected by neural dissociations? This remains to be answered. For the time being, let me just thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. Sorry to hover over you. There'll be a class coming in here at 2 o'clock. Um, for those who want to continue the, the discussion, David and I have booked the Delbridge room. Um, from now up until about 3.30, so we're going to continue this discussion uh, kindly with the Dolfo's um, input. So thank you very much. It was hugely stimulating. Thank you.